Okay, we're going to look at how this stuff is applied. You know, for a pendulum, physics tells us, and you can look at the videos I did in physics yesterday, I think they're very, very good, which is unusual. Okay? That I think they're very, very good. Uh, as they always are, I just never think of them. You believe that? Okay, well. Mx double prime equals negative Kx. And without doing the physics, I'll give you some idea what that means. M would be the mass of this bolt. Now, this bolt isn't a point mass. It's not a particle. It's not particle-like. Uh, but it can behave sort of that way. Okay? And you get the idea. So if I pull it back, it swings. Why does it go, start going that way? It starts going that way because gravity's pulling down on it. If I pull it back here, there's a tension in the string. Part of the tension in that string goes this way, another part goes this way. Part that goes this way mostly keeps the thing from falling. Part that goes this way, if I release my hand, there's nothing to stop it. And that accelerates the pendulum. Gets over here, as soon as it passes equilibrium, you start getting a component of the force in this direction, slows it down until it stops and it keeps going. In an ideal pendulum, where there's no energy lost, no air resistance, no flexing of the string, uh, no wobbling of my hand. Um, it keeps going forever. It never slows down. So for an ideal pendulum, and I guess I probably ought to put the word ideal here because in a minute we'll also look at what happens if it's got air resistance. Okay? It's a differential equation that you get, which is something that my physics students are not going to be able to do. Okay? Uh, I'll mention it. I'll say, yeah, take differential equations, you see. Okay? Um, um, uh, next year, when everything gets in sync, my physics students will be taking differential equations. So, in addition to showing where this comes from, they'll understand how to solve it. Now, they understand the solution. You know, I went all the way to the solution, but I didn't use differential equations to do it. Okay. So, M is the mass of the pendulum. <coughs> X is how far it is pulled back, how far from the equilibrium position it is at any instant. And the further you pull it back, the more force you get. There's some constant you multiply by how far you pull it back. It tells you how much force you got. Okay? You pull it back a little bit, you get a little bit of force. You pull it back twice as far, you get twice as much force. It's a linear restoring force. Okay? So this is a linear restoring force. called linear storing force. This is the mass x double prime is acceleration and by Newton's second law the net force is the mass times acceleration. So this is just Newton's second law. going to solve that equation. What kind of equation is that? Second order. Second order. Is it linear? Yeah. yeah, it's linear. M is the mass. It's not changing. The force constant is a constant. These are constants, right? So this is Second order linear. Okay? Now, you have to know how to recognize this. One thing I get with pre-calculus students, and I have tested out on you guys, but with pre-calculus students, they can't tell a different so linear equation from a quadratic equation. They try to solve a quadratic equation by putting all the x's on one side and it doesn't work and they get ridiculous solutions because they don't recognize what a quadratic equation is. They can't distinguish the equations. Okay? Most of them. 
Okay, some of them can. Um, but typically, people come out of an algebra sequence and cannot identify a quadratic equation to save them, even if it's in standard form. You know, 2x squared minus 5x plus 7 equals 0. Okay? Uh, now it comes back to them because they've done it, but they're rusty. It's like you all are a little rusty with your calculus. But that's come along okay. I mean, it's looking pretty good. Uh, we'll see how you do with the integration part. Okay, so second order linear, right? Is it homogeneous or non-homogeneous? Sorry? Non. Okay, you would think non-homogeneous because you have something besides zero on this side, but... It's homogeneous. So what do you do? I'm sorry? No. No, this is second now. order. What we had yeah. before was first order. Yeah. So that's not going to help. And we can also, you know, we really kind of want a one in front of the highest order term usually. Okay? So we can clearly write it this way. I don't know if that's going to help you or not, but what do you do when you see second order? That's what he was saying. Do the D e to the RT. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, good. Trial solution. I knew you knew. But, you know, you got to, there, there's a step in applying what you know perfectly well, okay, which is recognizing it. Not always the easiest thing to do. So trial function, or trial solution, we'll just use e to the r2. We could put a constant in front of this, but we kind of understand that a constant in front isn't going to change anything. It's the R that we're after. Okay? So, there it is. So, what's your characteristic equation? Well, what do you get if you take two derivatives of e to the rt? r squared e to the rt. Yeah, you get r squared e to the rt. And if you've done that, as many times as I've asked you to, which I think you have, yeah. that, that becomes kind of automatic, although you still want to write it out to remind yourself, okay? At least once a day. The first one of these you see in a day, write the thing out. After that, I think you're sufficiently reinforced, okay? So I'm not writing it all out, but you're going to get an r squared e to the rt here, right? And then you're just going to get k over m e to the rt here. And then you divide the e to the rt out, and you get r squared plus k over m equals 0, right? And what kind of equation is that? Quadratic, yes. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> you know what it was. Uh, get that word in your head. I mean, we're going to use it a lot because these things, second order linear almost always comes out with a quadratic equation. I mean, it always comes out with a quadratic equation, as long as you don't have a zero in front of x double prime. And if you did, it wouldn't be linear. Right? That's second order anymore. Okay? So we got r squared plus k over m equals zero. We could plug that into the quadratic formula. But since we don't have an r term in here, we can just say, so r squared is negative k over m, and r equals plus or minus the square root of k over m, which is plus or minus squared k over m times i. 
and that's not totally familiar. Go back and review Algebra 1. Uh, you know, review complex numbers and stuff. Uh, okay. So, your solution set is the set E to the square root of K over MI T E to the negative square root of K over M I T Okay? Okay, well, general solution is C1 E to the square root of K over M I T, right? Plus C2 E to the negative square root of K over M I T. Okay? Now we're not at M I T, but still they're doing the same thing right now. Okay? Uh, here, I'm not sure what they're doing in their course right now. Probably winning Nobel Prizes. Okay, so. Everything makes sense so far? It should. And if it doesn't, when you get back and look at it again and piece it together, which again I remind you, you need to do soon after class. Okay? Uh, it should. It's very straightforward. Okay, well, what is e to the square root of k over m times i t? What did I show you last? What's e to the i t? cosine t plus i sine t, right? And you see clearly how to get that out of the mm -hmm. yeah. Taylor series for sine and cosine. If you don't, make sure that you do next time, okay? Because otherwise you can forget it, you get it wrong. You should be able to go back to the Taylor series and see where it all is, okay? So anyhow, you do that and you said, okay, that's a cosine of the square root of k over m plus I sine of the square root of K over M T no I why did I write sine? It's because I wrote it last time uh, minus I sine of the square root of K over M T. And actually, I shouldn't have written it that way. Um, let's say plus. This would be negative square root of K over M T. This would be negative square root of K over M T. Right? Yeah. Now, from pre-calculus, you certainly remember, just like you remember waking up this morning, which you don't always remember well. Okay? You certainly should be able to remember that the cosine is an even function and the sine is an odd function. So if the cosine of negative square root of k over mt is just cosine square root of k over mt, the sine of negative square root of k over mt is the negative of the sine. So this equals c1 times the cosine of omega t, and where's that omega come from? That's what I'm going to call square root k over m because I'm tired of writing all that. Also because that's what everybody calls it. And it's identified with angular velocity. Something you'll learn to love in dynamics. And you'll learn to love it at some point next year probably. Okay?
Okay. I make it's just a weird W. We'll call it W. <laughs> just a weird uh, just trying to visualize you've probably what heard the, 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 the quote I'm the alpha and the omega not the alpha and the W <laughs> okay don't offend <laughs> and if you do get away from me I don't like lightning bolts <laughs> okay so anyhow uh, <coughs> um, right well, all this is, is yes. Um, Got to put I in there somewhere. Okay. Now, C1 and C2 can be any constants, including complex numbers. C1 and C2 can be complex number constants. I mean, we're in complex numbers here. And you do all your mathematics in complex numbers anyway. All engineering, all physics ultimately, but not at the first year level. Okay? That differential equation is all done complex numbers. But sometimes they turn out to be just real. And really we're interested in the real numbers, the real number solutions. But the point is that since C1 and C2 can be any real or complex numbers, that this could be any real or complex number, and this could be any real or complex number. Since this could be a complex number, when this isn't, you could have two real numbers here, a real number times a cosine plus a real number times the sine. Okay? Now I'm debating about whether I want to write out the details of that. But this then equals A cosine of omega t plus B sine of omega t, and I don't like to use A and B there, and I thought about it and I still did it. Reason I, there's a reason that I'll explain it to you. And I'm going to make the change. I'm going to get rid of that A. Rid of that B. I'm going to call this B, capital B, call this capital C, and say that this equals A times the cosine of omega T plus phi. Phi being the Greek letter between phi, pho, and thumb. Okay? And the point is that B is just C1 plus C2, and since C1 and C2 can be any old complex numbers, this could be a real number or a complex number. B could be any number at all, real or complex. Okay? And since C1 minus C2 could be any number, different than this one, but any number, okay? Then when we it could be uh, imaginary, and when we multiply it by i, it becomes real. And then the negative of that number would be C. So these could both be real numbers, or they could both be complex or imaginary, but we're mostly interested in when they're both real. So if these are real numbers, then there's a real number A that you get here, okay? Just by using the sum of two angles formula. What's the cosine of alpha plus beta? 
What's the sine of alpha plus beta? Now, you probably don't remember. I remembered when I went to college, but I had to really, yeah, I had to do a lot of problems and trick. Okay? Now, let me tell you how to uh, derive that identity. There's an identity. Mm -hmm. So if you know A and B, or B and C, you can figure out what A is and you can figure out what phi is. And you do this backwards. What's cosine of omega t plus phi? You've got a formula for that. And I can derive that formula without doing any triangles or any trigonometry. You know how I can derive that formula? You're going to love it. Are you ready to love something? <laughs> First time in this course? Uh, okay. Guess what I use? I use the Euler identity to derive it. And it's very simple. If you understand the laws of exponents, I believe you do. Unlike my pre-calculus students at this point, but we'll fix that soon. Okay? How do people get into pre-calculus not knowing the laws of exponents? How do they get out of algebra? They do. The conundrum. Okay, uh, and they shouldn't, but then you have to fail a lot of people. It's bad. It's a real, real conundrum. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, there are two sides of this argument. I don't usually acknowledge the side I don't like, but there are two sides. Okay, so I'm going to use theta instead of t, but e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine of theta. Okay? So, what's e to the i times alpha plus beta? Let's write that down for me. There are two ways this could be written down. When we compare them, we get the formulas for sum of two angles. Okay, not going to give you long, so don't copy everything I wrote. Just write down the answer to this, and you copy whatever you want. I see you did the wrong thing. You wrote down. <laughs> I'll nag you until you do what I ask. Okay, yeah, you could write it that way. That's okay. I'm going to go over your shoulder so you're under pressure. <laughs> okay. Is the exponent is the multiplication it's added? Huh? Is it turning the multiplication it's added or something like that? Is that what we're doing? I didn't say what we're doing. I just said write down another form of that. Okay. I'm and the, write down the most obvious one like Will didn't. <laughs> oh, I see what you're doing. Okay. So you're doing what Will did. You're going to get what Will got. Okay, so we'll do it. We'll do it. I mean, you got to do it both ways. Now, what, what you both wrote down was this is e to the i alpha, e to the i beta. Right? That what you were going to write down? Yeah. I mean, this is what you started to write down. I saw the i alpha there, I think. And then I saw another e. So I assume it's going to be e to the i beta. Okay. So, okay, that's fine. I mean, that gets us there. I would have thought the first thing you'd write down would be e to the i alpha plus beta equals the cosine of alpha plus beta plus i sine of alpha plus beta. Since it's a direct quote of what's right above it, right? But you went to the laws of exponents, and I'm glad you did, because it doesn't matter which one you do first, okay? I just kind of expected with that in front of you, you'd do this. So you have to, have to, have to mark that down in my notes where I'm psychoanalyzing you guys <laughs> and to try to figure out how that's related to all kinds of other stuff. Okay. Yeah, I do try to figure out what your style is so I can kind of address things that way. Okay, so anyhow, okay, well, okay, that's fine. Now, there's more to do than this. What's this? How could you write this? Out? No. Now, you could write this, but, you know, we've already been there, so we don't want to do that. How do we write this? Well, we could write it 
out as um, cosine alpha plus i. Sine yeah, I'll write that out. Just for the good for you. And don't even look at what I'm writing. I'm going to write it out, but you're going to write it out without looking at the board so I can get it written out and we can move on. You're going to use this, right? And you're going to write this out, and you're going to write this out. Just in case you didn't see it, I think you did. So this is Right? All of it's totally obvious, but how we put it together isn't necessarily totally obvious to see how it works out. Well, you see, now we got cosine of alpha plus beta and sine of alpha plus beta here. We got cosines of alpha and sines of alpha and cosines of beta and sines of beta up here. And this has to be equal to this. Okay? So, Tell me what to write down. I want to multiply this by this. Tell me what I've got to write down. You said multiply what by what? Well, I've got to use a distributive law to multiply this. Okay. Cosine alpha, cosine beta. Yeah, I'm going to start with cosine alpha, cosine beta, plus what? Plus cosine alpha, sine beta. I sine beta. I sine beta. I times cosine alpha sine beta. Okay? And then you know what the rest is. It's going to be I times sine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta. Okay? And this has to equal what? It's a little blurry over there, but you know what I'm writing. I'm writing this. Okay? So what do you conclude? Cosine of alpha plus beta is equal to What's the cosine of alpha plus beta? What's the sine of alpha plus beta have in this expression that the cosine doesn't? Huh? It has the i. So is this going to be part of i sine of alpha plus beta? Well, yeah, this one has the i. Is this going to contribute to the sine of alpha plus beta? Is this? Is this? Well, I'm kind of kidding. You get it. Right? So, write it down. I mean, the cosine of alpha plus beta ain't got no eyes. <laughs> okay? That's the identity. You got it. Okay, let's see what you've got. Okay, well, you're still writing down what I've got up there. Yeah. Don't do that. When I ask you to write something out, <laughs> okay, my bad. I'm take this and tell me what you get. You can copy that later, but of course it's going to be posted. Okay. So you don't absolutely have to copy it. 
because I don't want to wait for you to copy everything down to move on. Like I said, keep nagging. Okay, well I think you're going to get it, but we can't wait. There's cosine of alpha plus beta. It doesn't have any eyes. This doesn't have any eyes, and this is also blind. Okay? So cosine of alpha plus beta equals what? It's this and this. This is very simple. The only thing I was really concerned about when I asked you to write this out was whether you would see that the laws of exponent allow you to write this. And that's exactly what you wrote, so I was happy to see that. I also observed that having this right there, it would be pretty natural to write this down, but if you didn't write it here, and I said write it out in a different way and pointed to that or something, you might have done this, right? Okay? You, want to, you have to see both. Two things, you bring them together, you set them equal, and you get a profound result. It's much easier, much, much easier. I mean, the whole Taylor series and everything is easier than the way you prove this using triangles. Geometry is, I mean, it's, it's, it's accessible at the high school level, except it's, geometry is not taught at the high school level anymore. Um, and, it, and as a result, people never learn it. Uh, makes it difficult to teach optics. Uh, anyhow, uh, you put the things together and you get this conclusion, and then everything that is an underline gives you the sine alpha, sine beta, which has got to be cosine alpha, sine beta, plus sine alpha, cosine beta. Now, I remembered the form of these formulas, but I didn't memorize the formulas. I never remembered which was which. I just wrote it down and said, okay, if alpha is 45 degrees and beta is 45 degrees, does this make sense? Okay? Now, if I was using it regularly, you know, I'd, I'd remember them. But I'd always test them. I'd always test them to make sure I didn't screw up, ruin my whole career. Okay? In my, in my freshman year of college. Um, well, now let's apply the formula to A cosine of omega t plus phi. 